Hello everyone, welcome to the lecture series on basic cognitive processes. I am Dr. Ark Verma from IIT Kanpur. Today we are going to uh, talk about signal detection theory. As you know in the last lectures we have been talking about sensation and perception. We have been talking about how to measure sensation. In one of the earlier lectures I have told you about uh, classical psychophysics and how it has been used to measure elements of sensation. We have talked about quite a few methods uh, most of which come under classical psychophysical theory uh, in order to determine concepts like absolute threshold, different threshold, etc. We have seen that these processes basically help us identify when a person is feeling a particular sensation and how that sensation can be quantified using uh, some of the methods like the method of adjustment or the method of constant stimuli etc. Today I will be talking to you about a particular theory which kind of diverges in its approach towards measuring sensation. This particular theory is called signal detection theory. We will see some of the merits and maybe uh, you know how this theory is slightly different from other class, uh, classical psychophysical methods. Now we have been talking about the importance of thresholds, is not it? Uh, how would it uh, you know how would it be if say for example we do not need to determine threshold in the first place. Can we do with something else? Can we do with a you know related concept which does not really merely uh, you know depend on determining at what point somebody perceives a particular you know physical stimulus. Uh, according to the theory of signal detection our perception in general is controlled by uh, evidence and decision processes. So any uh, you know stimulus in the environment uh, can be treated off as an evidence. Say for example a particular uh, ray of light falling on the retina is evidence of light you know that is there in the external environment and you have to take a decision whether the light is let us say bright enough or not or whether the light is uh, you know whether there is any light at all in the first place. So signal detection theory basically uh, you know uh, assumes these processes as a sum of uh, both evidence which is uh, you know the property of the stimulus and decision processes that are the property of the perceiver. Uh, a signal or a stimulus creates evidence uh, that depends on the intensity of the signal and also the acuity of the observer. Say for example, I ask you to distinguish between two shapes, uh, partly this depends upon how different the two shapes are from each other if it is a, a, you know, a small line and it is a very large line uh, next to it. Also it depends on your ability to see the difference between the two stimuli. So that is acuity uh, of you, acuity of the perceiver or the observer. Both of these factors interact to determine whether you will give a yes response to the question that things are different or whether you have detected something. There could also be other factors which determine how uh, you know you are going to respond to that question. Say for example, the willingness of an observer to say yes, maybe if you are not very sure, maybe if the decision is slightly uh, you know uh, valuable to make, maybe you will not say yes. Okay, maybe you will wait for completely more uh, you know completely uh, convincing case and more evidence to say yes. These kind of influences which determine whether you want to say yes or not or your willingness to say yes or not are called response biases. These response bias influences uh, you know also include the payoff for being accurate or uh, the frequency of the signal and so many other factors. We will talk about them as we move ahead. Uh, look at this figure here, you will see uh, this is basically how uh, you know a theoretical representation of what signal detection really means. You can see that there are sensory systems here, uh, there is a particular sensory module in the brain and the sensory module in the brain kind of you know evaluates the evidence values which is basically the intensity of the stimulus and those kind of things. Then you will see that these evidence values feed on to a particular box which is the decision module you know the brain has to decide whether to say different or not different or whether to say detected or not detected and in there you will see a modulating factor is the payoffs or the motivation or vigilance how alert you were if you were you know uh, if that when that signal was presented. Uh, what is the frequency of that signal does it happen once in 100 times or does it happen let us say 60 times in 100 times. Okay, uh, this decision making module of the brain actually uh, you know leads on to the kind of responses that you will end up giving. So this in, in nutshell is how uh, signal detection theory really uh, you know uh, approaches this whole aspect of uh, people detecting particular, pers uh, particular sensations. Uh, 
let us take an example uh, of the fact, you know, of the willingness thing. Say, for example, imagine uh, if your friend has set up a blind date for you. Okay. Uh, now, you have to really uh, tell him uh, by uh, within one hour or so uh, whether you're interested in going on that date or not. Now, you're thinking. Now, what could be the cost of such a decision? You know, the maximum cost for, uh, you know, saying no to a blind date uh, or saying yes to a blind date in that sense could be, let us say, you'll waste an evening. You know, you do not like the person you were set up with. You did not like their behavior and stuff. So maximum what will happen? You'll waste an evening. Maybe you will say, for example, not even like the food. Uh, these costs are slightly lesser, isn't it? Uh, and, you know, uh, and the possible benefits could be much higher. See, for example, if you like the person, if the, uh, you know, if the two of you strike a chord and, you know, an exciting evening happens and many more uh, happen in the future. So th this kind of is a cost versus benefit uh, analysis of this decision. Okay. In such scenarios, when the costs are slightly lesser as compared to possible benefits, uh, people basically, uh, you know, highly favor a yes strategy. So what they will do is that they will kind of, you know, evaluate uh, what are the costs, what are the benefits. If they find that the benefits are slightly more uh, than the cost, they will actually go on with the uh, yes response more often than not. Uh, this decision, uh, basically, if you see now, is based on the analysis of costs and benefit uh, because you do not really have any information about the stimulus. You do not know about the girl. It is a blind date. You do not know what else to take into account. That is one way of doing it. However, uh, if you have a high cost decision to make, say for example, if you have to say yes or no to a marriage proposal that maybe one of your parents have brought to you, now, you still, if you don't know, uh, you know, uh, uh, any information about the girl, you do not know, uh, you know, what is, what does she look like, what is her education, other things that you might want to consider, how would you do it then? People have been found to be very careful and very conservative in scenarios where the possible uh, benefits or, you know, where the incurred costs are much more than the possible benefits. In terms of decision theory, most of us there in these kind of scenarios are very conservative decision makers when costs are higher relative to the benefits. Okay. Uh, now, leaving aside this kind of a process, uh, let us talk about uh, the sensory processes here. So, the sensory processes basically, uh, you know, they transmit a particular value to the decision making modules, the decision processes. If this value is uh, considerably high, the decision is more likely to yield a yes response because you have enough evidence to say yes, okay, about any decision, uh, about the fact that there is light in the room, about the fact that there is a, you know, a particular uh, kind of temperature in the room, those kind of things. Obviously, you uh, evaluate the costs and benefits. If this value given by the sensory processes to the decision making process is low, uh, the evidence is less, then basically what will happen is that you are more likely to yield a no response. Okay. Once again, take after taking into account the costs and the benefits. Uh, now, what determines the quality of this signal? You know, what determines uh, what kind of signal that is coming in? Signal detection theory has two assumptions. First is that it assumes that there is always noise uh, present. You know, there is always a disturbance that can be confused with signals and is always present whenever a human being attempts to, you know, detect any kind of signal. Uh, and these, uh, these, the source of this noise could be anything. It could be environmental changes, it could be equipment changes, maybe you are measuring, uh, you know, uh, temperature for example, using different kinds of thermometers. There will be some degree of error, you know. There is this concept of zero error in the physical uh, measurement instruments. Uh, it could be spontaneous neural activity because here the measurement is not actually an external device, the measurement is you yourself. Maybe you're not attentive enough at that point in time. Maybe you're just slightly tired and so somebody is speaking and you cannot really attend uh, to it uh, very, uh, you know, uh, attentively, say. Okay. So, in that sense, it's very possible that somebody is telling you something and you kind of, you know, you just mind your, your mind wandered somewhere and you missed uh, the details of what was said. A lot of time that might happen when somebody is giving out a shopping list, you kind of, you know, uh, slightly uh, are not concentrating and some of the Im important ingredients are left out and, you know, that, lead, that might lead to problems. There could be other sources of these kind of, uh, you know, uh, noise uh, as well. Say, for example, uh, you know, different kind of experimental manipulations can be done with the receiver. Uh, 
Uh, let us look at one of these kind of experimental manipulation. Imagine if you're sitting in a soundproof booth wearing headphones. You know, it's a soundproof booth. You're just given headphones and you've been asked to decide whether you've heard a faint tone combined with white noise or you only heard white noise. Maybe it could be just a machine generated tone like pa, pa, something like that. And it is, uh, you know, mixed with white noise, which is again system generated noise. Does not have a lot of meaning. Uh, a trial might begin by presentation of a flashlight that is to gain your attention, to get you ready. Then what you hear is a burst of white noise, which now may or may not contain the faint tone signal. Now you have to decide whether this white noise contained that signal or not. You would say yes if you think a tone signal was present. You would say no if you think it was not. Now signal detection theory in these kind of scenarios assumes that any stimulus, even noise, produces what is called a distribution of evidence. You know, there will be different points. So each, the evidence on each trial will be just one point, but you will actually go through many such trials. So there will be a distribution of all of these, uh, you know, uh, points. So basically what will happen is say for example also since evidence cannot be directly observed the distribution for stimulus trials and noise trials are both they will be hypothetical. Uh, what you might have is that uh, the evidence for trial for which only noise occurred will tend to be small. There will be less evidence there uh, so that over many trials a hypothetical distribution with a very small mean will be established. So if you are trying to just draw a distribution of the noise trials uh, very few trials had noise so a very small mean and a very small distribution will be there. If you think of trials where noise and uh, signal that is the faint tone were both presented, you will basically have a larger distribution with a greater mean. Again formed over many trials, okay, you are still talking about that experiment. Now so you will have two distributions, one will be the noise distribution, the other will be the signal plus noise distribution. Since these two distributions will anyways overlap somewhere in the middle, some values of evidence will be slightly ambiguous. You know, those are values where you are not really sure about where the, whether there was noise or whether there was only noise or whether there was signal in the noise as well. Uh, here is what this distribution might look like. So you have a noise distribution, you have a signal plus noise distribution and you have a distance between the means of these two distributions. This distance basically is called D prime, which is basically your uh, uh, sensitivity. Okay, we'll talk about this uh, very shortly. So, uh, how do you decide, uh, you know, whether there was noise present or not? You need to set some criterion that beyond this point, I'll say that yes, the signal was present. Uh, before this point, I will say no, the signal is not present. So, a criterion must therefore be set to determine whether you will give a yes response or a no response. The position for this criterion is basically set up by what is called the decision process. If the cost and benefits uh, analysis kind of, you know, uh, uh, says uh, favors a liberal decision policy, you know, things like uh, going on a blind date with somebody, uh, the criterion will be set slightly further to the left and so that most of the responses will yield in a yes response. Most of the trials will yield in a yes response. If it is a conservative decision policy, you know, something very important, the criterion will move slightly towards the right and what you will do is you will say more no responses. Okay, it basically depends on the uh, value of the decision. So here is how you, you know, really plot the criterion. You can move the criterion slightly to the right uh, to uh, yield more no responses, slightly to the left to yield more yes responses. Okay, this is, uh, this decision criteria is called beta. Okay, so it determines basically whether you will make a yes response or whether you will make a no response. So if that is clear, uh, we can slightly move further. Uh, we can understand that, you know, anyways, anyhow this distribution turns up, there will be some errors of judgment, you know, and there will be some values where you will not really be clear. If you detected the correct signal, for example, this will be called a hit. If say for example, you've incorrectly responded yes, where there was no signal, then that scenario will be called a scenario of false alarm. So if you're following a very liberal decision making strategy, you're saying yes to everything, then what you what will happen is you'll have a lot of hits, yes, but you'll have a lot of false alarms as well because your tendency is to say yes to most responses. On the other hand, if you follow a conservative decision strategy, then there will be a low number of hits and there'll also be a low number of false alarms. So you will uh, probably have very few false alarms, but you will have a lot of misses as well because you did not say yes when the signal was there because you following, you want to be uh, really very, very sure 
of the presence of the signal. Now, if you plot this, uh, you know, if you plot a function of uh, hits as a function of false alarms, uh, and as the criteria moves from conservative to liberal, we'll get a particular figure. This figure is basically known as the receiver operating characteristic or the ROC curve. In this figure, you can see, and I'll just show you in a moment, that both hits and false alarms are infrequent, uh, are actually infrequent at the lower left of the curve. You can see the figure here at the lower left side of the curve. Uh, but both hits and false alarms become more and more frequent if you move towards the upper right side of this particular curve. Okay, so uh, this is basically uh, something which tells you about the decision making process as well, that whether you're following a, a conservative process or a liberal process. Uh, the slope of this particular function will tell you two things. If there is a flat slope, it will tell you that you have been following a liberal decision making criterion. If the slope is slightly steeper, you will, it will reveal a conservative criterion that you have been you know, having very few hits but very few false alarms as well. The slope of this curve basically uh, such as the ROC function is determined by a slope of the line that is drawn as a tangent to this curve and it will interact either of the axis. It might interact the x axis or you know, the y axis. If the uh, curve is too steep, it will probably, uh, you know, intersect with the y axis, uh, with the x axis. If it is slightly flatter, it will kind of, uh, you know, uh, intersect the y axis. Now, the distance, if you see this figure again, the distance from the diagonal to this curve uh, tells us how far apart the noise and the signal plus noise distributions are. When these two distributions are far apart, they indicate and indicating either a more discernible signal or a more uh, acute observer. So there could be two things, isn't it? Uh, either the signal is very clear so that you can, uh, you know, uh, detect it all the time. Either you are very good at detecting that signal. So whether it, uh, you know, indicates a very discernible signal or whether it det uh, indicates a very acute observer, the ROC curve moves upward to the left. Okay, and away from the diagonal as shown by the heavy ROC function. You can see this one here. You can see one of these figures is slightly higher dotted. It's a slightly heavier line, the one at the top. Okay, uh, when the signal is less detectable or say for example, the observer is not very good at detecting that uh, and the, distribu the distributions will be slightly closer together. So the ROC curve will move slightly closer to the diagonal. So you can see here that this will be uh, slightly, uh, you know, closer to the diagonal, which is the lighter ROC function which you can see here. So the D uh, prime basically is much smaller than the D prime in the uh, earlier part. Okay. So the ROC function basically tells us about both. It tells us about the sensory processes, uh, you know, that is the distance between the signal plus noise and the noise uh, and basically on the noise distributions. It also tells us the criteria which you have been following. It also tells us about the decision making process, which is beta. Okay. Now, uh, what does this, you know, uh, signal detection method or wh what does this theory really have in for us? Okay. One of the major advantage of the signal detection uh, methods over a classical psychophysic, uh, psychophysical procedures like we had in the last lecture, uh, such as for example, the method of limits is that there is this ability to measure and quantify both the sensitivity of the observer and the response wise. Both can really be, you know, plotted and figured out here. I have not gone into uh, great detail about those um, calculations because again, we are just, uh, you know, doing uh, this at an int introductory level, we are not really going into much more detail. But those of you interested uh, can actually look into them and maybe ask questions. Uh, but uh, this ability of really talking about and quantifying both sensitivity and response bias is really important. In many areas of applied psychology, say for example, you know, this ability uh, to distinguish between these two processes is very important. I'll, I can take an example of, say for example, you know, if there is a, you know, if there is a soldier at, uh, at the border, you know, and he's basically reading, uh, taking readings from the radar. You know, uh, whether a particular enemy is approaching or whether an enemy is not approaching basically is a costly decision. If the enemy is approaching and you miss it, uh, you kind of, you know, are putting everybody else in danger. If it's not the enemy and you, you know, uh, shoot down somebody by mistake, you're still committing a grave crime. So that kind of decision is slightly uh, expensive to make. Or say, for example, if you're a doctor and somebody comes and shows you their, uh, you know, x-ray report and you have to detect whether there's a cancerous tumor present or not. Uh, it can again be a very costly decision. 
if you go by a very conservative strategy and say yes there is tumor and you know there is a poor patient uh, who's come uh, you are throwing him to you know a particular uh, resort of buying very expensive medicines etc etc which were not needed in the first place or if you actually follow a very conservative uh, strategy and you say no there is no tumor you fine and, and the person kind of end, di ends up you know dying uh, because uh, the tumor was not diagnosed uh, in time then also you're committing a very grave mistake so in those kind of decisions, you know, in those kind of scenarios, uh, signal detection kind of methods are really very important and they, are, have, they have been extensively used as well. I'll take an example to elaborate on this, uh, you know, uh, here. Say, for example, to determine how analgesics work, Clark and colleagues, uh, they conducted a number of experiments on pain analgesia. They wanted to test whether how and how basically these analgesics like aspirin, etc. work. So they basically decided to use signal de detection procedure instead of the classical uh, psychophysics methods and what they do was, uh, you know, they basically in these experiments, they used something called a dolorimeter uh, to evoke pain by means of thermal stimulation. So it was an instrument that was applied in the skin, it kind of, uh, you know, delivered heat in some sense and that could, uh, you know, either lead to pain or, you know, less pain or more pain, something like that. Initially, uh, Clark found that analgesics such as aspirin reduce the D prime, they reduce the sensitivity of the observer, which means the uh, drug basically, uh, you know, is uh, really reducing or lowering down the acuity of the sensory system uh, with the outcome being that, you know, the, as, uh, the ability of the observer to distinguish between painful and non-painful stimulus is lowered down. Okay, it might, this kind of thing might have its own benefits. Uh, but then they went on to investigate whether placebos or acupuncture, etc., uh, altered D prime, or whether placebos or acupuncture uh, changed the willingness of the participant to report pain. In both these experiments, Clark found that placebos and acupuncture basically elevated the subject's decision criterion. So, a stronger stimulation was needed for the subject to say yes or for the subject to report a pain detection response. Now, this actually does not mean that placebos and acupuncture, etc. will not work, but what they are doing is they are working with a slightly different method, okay. They are basically changing the decision threshold, okay. They are not changing the sensitivity of the observer, the sensitivity is still there, but the decision threshold is actually changed. Uh, also, drawing from earlier work done by Hardy and colleagues, 1952, it was found that using it was found using methods of limits that suggestions, if you tell somebody that you know you're not feeling pain or uh, stuff like that, also alters absolute threshold. So, given the kind of work we saw just now, a uh, signal detection uh, uh, method used by Clark and colleagues, it is reasonable to suppose that suggestion basically what it did was, it changed the absolute threshold by altering the decision criterion of subject. So, you are basically suggesting to the person that no, you are not feeling pain, no, you are not feeling pain, until the pain becomes unbearable uh, for the participant to actually report pain. Okay, so the same could be true for other kinds of occurrences as well. Say, for example, if you have a knife observer, somebody who's not been part of this experiment, and you kind of you know start this experiment with this kind of participant, you will see that the knife observers will have a very lower threshold. They'll immediately say, "Yes, I felt pain. I uh, felt pain." Something like that. Now, this basically, these kind of things could not have been determined using classical psychophysical methods. You know, uh, you cannot know about decision criterion, etc. Uh, using classical psychophysical methods and this in itself is a major advantage, a major, major advantage of uh, signal detection kind of methods. So, coming to the close, trying to sum up, we found out that signal detection measures are a departure from the classical psychophysical methods as they take into account both the sensitivity of the observer and the evidence provided by the stimulus and also the decision making processes. So, it kind of takes care of all of these three things. And they are better because they help us understand the decision making process of uh, the participant experiencing and reporting these sensations. So, this is basically, you know, the end of the uh, series about psychophysics. In the next class onwards, we will start talking about issues related to perception. Thank you.